we've actually created a legal contract that is legally binding called the Programmable IP License. And we worked very hard to create that with some world-class legal teams. It's almost like, think about it like a YC safe or like a very simple drop-down menu legal license that covers 99% of use cases on story. And our smart contracts that uh, that allow people to set their licensing terms and their rights, they actually match one-to-one with that license. So what you get is this one-to-one correspondence where code is law and law is code. And as someone who's just an on-chain native, you can feel comfortable using our smart contracts knowing that it's backed by the law, but without having to think about it at all. So we're sort of like this parallel rail for the legal system where if you don't care about licensing, you don't care about rights, you don't care about IP, that's great. You can still use story. Just think about it in terms of NFTs and, and you know, license tokens and royalty tokens, like all of that is abstracted away for you. But if you care, then it's there, right? So it's almost like an on-ramping uh, in, in the world of DeFi, like a fiat on-ramp or an off-ramp where we abstract away a lot of the details. Hey, everybody. Tanner here with Wagme Ventures. On today's episode, we have Jason Zhao, co-founder and head of product at Story Protocol. For anyone who's new, this is the Wagme Ventures podcast, where we do snapshots with interesting builders, founders, and investors from across Web3. Check out wagmeventures.io to learn more about the syndicate behind the podcast. But for now, let's get into it with Jason at Story. All right. What's up, everybody? This is Tanner on the Wagme Ventures podcast. I'm here today with Jason Zhao, co-founder and head of product at Story Protocol. Jason, what's up, man? How are you doing today? Hey, Tanner. Great to chat. Yeah, super pumped. Glad you're here. No, we have a ton to talk about, too. So we might as well just jump right in. I'd love to start maybe just learning a little bit more about your kind of your particular crypto journey and how it's intersected with your professional journey through Google DeepMind, scouting for Sequoia, ultimately leading up to the creation of Story Protocol. Maybe you could talk us through that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So how I got into crypto is pretty interesting. I, I actually started out, I studied philosophy in university, and I also got a master's in computer science. Really what I spent most of my time thinking about was actually at DeepMind, I was a product manager there. And my goal was to essentially commercialize a lot of the interesting research coming out of DeepMind's labs. And so I've always been super interested in number one, how does super technical research at the cutting edge of whether it's AI or crypto or any other technology, how does that get translated into a very tangible consumer product? What is a pipeline from research to production? And that was my job at DeepMind is build Google scale products on the back of the research coming out of the labs. That was a very fun job. But I, I really, as I started to start reading more of these white papers around Bitcoin, Ethereum, and, and getting deeper into the crypto research side of things, one of the things I was really impressed by was exactly how quickly the research moves in crypto. So you can publish a white paper, let's say Uniswap, Caden Adams created that out of a blog post that took a couple months, and then they launched the smart contracts. And then instantly, there's just hundreds of thousands of people interacting with the smart contracts. There's people trying to fork it, there's people building apps on top of it and front ends on top of it. And of course, there's vampire attacks and malicious attacks as well. But all this contributes to like a very frothy, organic, Darwinian environment where ideas move from research to products very quickly and very in a very open way. Whereas in AI, there is a lot of obviously interesting research, but only a few organizations are well equipped to produce that research because there's so little, there's so much compute and data required. There's very few organizations that actually do that. So it's a lot more siloed, it's a lot slower. So I was really obsessed with this research and production pipeline. And then the second thing is I mentioned, I studied philosophy and in particular political theory. So I'm very interested in how technology impacts political structures, how technology impacts our understanding of ourselves. And again, when I was starting to get into crypto, uh, I was reading these early white papers and I was very impressed by how philosophically and ideologically driven a lot of the early cypherpunks were, Vitalik, Satoshi, and even before then in the creation of these first blockchains. That was interesting, but also around that time, there was a lot of discourse on DAOs and experiencing experiments in governance and how can we redistribute ownership at, at scale to the users and the builders of the network, which is more communitarian and in some cases even a little socialist, which I found very interesting. And then of course, there's a lot of pure capitalism in crypto, as we all know. And so I think that what was interesting to me also is that from a philosophical perspective, blockchain as a technology is a sort of political mirror. And you can come in with a libertarian view, you can come in with a more communitarian socialist view, you can come in with uh, a capitalist view and find your worldview reflected in that. And I found that very exciting. So all of those things really led me to become really intellectually and pro professionally interested in crypto. And with Story, the, the vision was we looked around and we saw that there's so much innovation in DeFi. There's so much innovation from blockchains in, in the world of money, whether it's Bitcoin as an immutable store of value or stable coins as a cross-border payment solution. But what was really exciting and, and missing is this opportunity to build something that is old cultural infrastructure, right? So in the same way that money was programmable through DeFi, can we actually make culture and IP programmable through story. Uh, and we wanted to create the rails for a new 
parallel creative ecosystem uh, because we saw this parallel financial ecosystem, but not this creative ecosystem. So that's sort of how I got into crypto. And then also the, the reasoning and the opportunity that we're seeing at Story to build something that really affects a lot of people. Because at the end of the day, most people don't spend most of their time on Charles Schwab or Robin Hood. People spend their time consuming culture and creating culture. And so that's where we wanted to have an impact. Yeah, super interesting. Okay. So for anyone who's unfamiliar, could you maybe just explain what, what Story Protocol is and what you seek to kind of enable with what your team is building here, maybe just at the start? We'll talk maybe a little bit about where things are going to, but kind of in its totality right now, what is Story Protocol? Yeah, absolutely. So Story Protocol is building the programmable IP layer. And people always ask, well, what is programmable IP? I've never heard of that. Uh, and what we're really trying to do with programmable IP, I think the best way to phrase it is in the context of DeFi, because people really understand that there's a mature DeFi ecosystem in crypto. And what DeFi did was make money programmable, right? So you have the comparison here is you have a, a physical dollar bill, for example, in your wallet, you can go to the corner store, you can buy soda with it. It's, it's sort of limited, it has value. Now you move that dollar on chain, right? You have a USDC or USDT stable coin. And it's the same dollar, you still have the same amount of money. But because it's a piece of software, you can actually permissionlessly enable an entire ecosystem of financial applications to be built on top, whether that's DEXs like Swap or liquid staking or lending and like Aave or Compound. I can swap that USDC for ETH on Uni, stake that ETH on Lido, get staked ETH, put that staked ETH as collateral on Aave or Compound, get, get Compound staked ETH. And that's all happening permissionlessly. And it's a real innovation. But when you think about how, how does intellectual property work? How does a world of creativity work? Well, it's all run by IP. But that IP is, is still in the dollar bill era, so to speak. It's still in the pen and paper era where think about any of your favorite characters or your favorite songs, like they're secured by mountains and mountains of paperwork and teams of lawyers. And what that means is that there's no legibility into who can access IP. How do I actually make use of other people's IP? How can other people make use of my IP in the form of licensing and, and creating derivatives? And so only the top 1% of studios and creators can access IP, can create licensing deals, can really monetize what they're doing. And we really wanted to democratize that. And we thought the solution was just taking an example from DeFi to build uh, programmability into IP. So what we've done is built a set of on-chain smart contracts that allow anyone to register any form of IP, creative IP, whether it's a song or a character or a comic on story in a very standardized, global, composable data format. So you have this universal media library and then any application can build on top of that. But what's really important here is once you register the IP, you also set the terms for how other people can engage with your IP. So you set the rules for engagement for how people can remix and extend your work, whether there's an upfront fee or some revenue share, that's all embedded on chain. So we're not just moving the media files on chain, we're moving the rights on chain as well. And we really think that by making IP sovereign and programmable, we can create multiplayer versions of IP where it's really easy to extend someone's work and build a graph almost like in the same way that open source code can grow in a graph, IP can grow in a graph-like manner, and then also easily compose these IP Legos. So I can take an Azuki and that's registered on story, take a Pudgy that's registered on story. I don't know any of these people that own them, but I know their terms and I can programmatically license them into a comic book I'm making without having to talk to anyone, without having to know any of the legal terms. I just make two button clicks and I have these two uh, characters in my comic or in my artwork, and I can share revenue with them if I generate revenue. So building this global on-chain IP graph where each IP can set the rules for engagement and making IP multiplayer through these IP Legos is essentially the vision behind story. And of course, I'm happy to jump deeper into the, how, how the tech works. Yeah, I'd love to, I would love to actually get there. And it's super interesting what you guys are building. Hey, everybody, quick thing here. We're excited to announce Wagme Advisory, your home for all things fundraising, hiring, and partnerships. This is all about supercharging your project with the Wagme Network, consisting of over 20,000 executives, investors, and builders in crypto, all ready to come alongside your project to help it succeed. Get in touch at team at wagmeventures.io to learn more and figure out if Wagme Advisory is the right fit for your project. Now, let's get back to the show. I think one one place I'd like to maybe take this conversation here just early on is I just reading the blog, the Story Protocol blog, and I think it was the one this past February that said this. It said, by injecting scarcity into the world of digital assets that could otherwise be replicated at zero marginal cost, NFTs serve as the foundation for digital provenance. However, NFTs alone are not enough. The current generation of static JPEGs have hit a natural ceiling in their development. So longer excerpt there, but I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about kind of maybe just narrating where we've been, where we're going. How do NFTs play into this vision you're describing and what you're building? Maybe we can touch on the tech there as part of that conversation. Absolutely. And it's a, it's a great question and one that we get all the time, which is 
haven't NFTs solved this problem? Haven't they brought culture and media on chain? And I think that they do provide a very important foundation. But before I jump into exactly how NFTs play into this solution that we built that story, I also want to talk about just the sort of philosophy behind intellectual property in general and creative work in general. If you think about physical property, it's naturally scarce, right? Like there's only so many beachside mansions you can have. And so of course it's going to accrue in value because you can only build like, let's say three or four mansions on this beach. And, and most physical property works like this, where it's scarce, whether it's oil, electricity, things like this. But if you think about creative works or ideas, right? I have an idea to make a spaceship. I have an idea to make a bicycle. I have an idea that is a, a Shakespeare uh, play, right? Or some sort of artwork. If I tell someone about that idea, they can go and use it themselves. They can tell all their friends. There's no natural scarcity. It's naturally abundance. And so in that context, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but you still, the world runs on incentives. And so you need to incentivize people to create interesting things, culturally relevant things, create new technologies and inventions. And that's why IP is there, right? It's to inject a layer of scarcity into a sort of form of property that has no natural notion of scarcity and is naturally abundant. And so I, I think looking at the history of IP, it wasn't really invented as a concept unle- until the Gutenberg printing press was invented. And that that really allowed people to copy written work at scale, which is a great thing. But then if you're a creator, then you're thinking, well, okay, I'm going to create like this great book or pamphlet, and then someone's just going to print 5,000 copies of it, and I'm not going to generate every, any revenue. So the first IP laws were actually created to incentivize creation in the wake of a technological innovation. And now I think the internet and especially AI, generative AI, is bringing us into another technological revolution when it comes to information and creativity. And now we need new updated IP infrastructure, right? That does the same job of injecting scarcity into something that's naturally abundant, but in a way that's programmable and operates at the speed and scale of the internet. And that's what story's trying to be. Now, how does NFTs play into it? Well, NFTs, I think they did one thing really well, which is bring media on chain. But IP is not just media, it's media plus rights. So I, and we think most NFTs today are pretty static, right? They're just a pointer to a media file. Oftentimes that media file doesn't even live on chain. And if I wanted to do anything with this media, right? And I'll just give you the simplest example I, I gave before, which is you have an NFT, I have an NFT, they both represent characters. I want to create a comic that's on chain, a, a third NFT. And I want to use your Pudgy or your Azuki or whatever NFT you have. How does that process work? Well, I have to go read my licensing terms around my NFT to see what I can do. I have to go read your licensing terms on some website about what you can do. Then I have to go and contact you, Tanner. And we have to get into conversation and figure out how we're going to split the royalties, how we're going to split the revenues. And then once we figure that out, we got to hire a lawyer to, to actually enshrine that in a legal contract. And then one of us has to trust the other that they're going to stream the royalties. So the moment you try to do anything with IP or media on chain, it, it just gets shoved back into the traditional pen and paper world that's super inefficient. And so what Story is doing and, and, and adding on to NFTs is that we actually use NFTs to represent all the media, but then we add a layer of information and programmability to those NFTs. So any existing NFT can register on Story. Any new NFT can register on Story. But what we're adding in the tech level is a smart contract wallet to each NFT, a Story wallet that stores a bunch of important metadata around the IP and also gives it access to licensing, to royalties, to all these different functions that didn't exist before. So you can think about us as leveraging the composability of NFTs, but really supercharging them by adding on a whole new layer of programmability. Super interesting. Okay. Love it. So I have a recurring question on this podcast. It's just kind of about early challenges, just because I typically find or believe that early challenges and how they're solved shape the life of an organization, right? But I think I'm curious, I'd love to almost narrow this sort of recurring question specifically to the rights component, where you mentioned, yes, there's media, but there's also rights. And I'm curious, that that seems especially tricky to have to basically, you know, more or less like reinvent some kind of legal system of some kind, right? I'm sure that's not the right phrase. Some system that can that can make this all programmable and composable and easy. I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about what solving that challenge looked like and how that sort of shaped things at Story. Yeah, it's a great question. And we have a very philosophical approach to this and a very intentional approach. But at a high level, what we're doing, the process looked like first, understand what's going on in the legal world right now. Like what is the current state of the art in Hollywood? What is the current state of the art on platforms like TikTok? I think it's really important, especially in crypto, to understand like what you're up against and what the specific problems are. So luckily, my co-founders have had a lot of experience in that space. So we drew from their experience and, and try to really identify what specific market failures are there, right? And I think we, we identified a lot. Number one, it's extremely difficult for creators to monetize. 
Number two, with AI, it's extremely difficult to protect and track your IP. You're seeing all these crazy remixes of like Harry Potter or Drake's voice, and that's great. And we think that's the future of AI. But then we need to turn that into a win situation where Drake and someone who remixes his voice can both earn revenue, not just this loose situation where Drake doesn't make any money from these remixes and neither does Remixer. So we identified these market failures. And then we thought about how can crypto uniquely unlock a solution, right? And that's kind of how we came up with Story. But as you said, a lot of the challenges are that the legal system is extremely complicated. It People don't want to learn about it and they shouldn't have to. And so it's sort of a sort of opaque and threatening type of industry, right? To, pe- to most people, they don't want to think about that. And the, the reality is it is opaque and it is somewhat threatening because that's the way it's been structured. But we think that we can really change the narrative around that. And so what we really strove to do was not to create a purely separate legal system, right? Like that's purely on chain. We wanted to, we still think as a creator, you want to create a movie, you're going to have to deal with copyright. And so it's important to have this link between the traditional legal world and the the on-chain world of story protocol in the same way that if you're on DeFi, like a lot of people will eventually want to off-ramp or on-ramp, right? Like you you should be able to do most things on-chain, but then you might need to buy a car or buy a house and you're, you're going to want to off-ramp. And so we thought about it in that way where we've actually created a legal contract that is legally binding called the Programmable IP License. And we worked very hard to create that with some world-class legal teams. It's almost like, think about it like a YC safe or like a very simple drop-down menu legal license that covers 99% of use cases on story. In our smart contracts that, that allow people to set their licensing terms and their rights, they actually match one-to-one with that license. So what you get is this one-to-one correspondence where code is law and law is code. And as someone who's just an on-chain native, you can feel comfortable using our smart contracts knowing that it's backed by the law, but without having to think about it at all. So we're sort of like this parallel rail for the legal system, where if you don't care about licensing, you don't care about rights, you don't care about IP, that's great. You can still use story. Just think about it in terms of NFTs and license tokens and royalty tokens. Like all of that is abstracted away for you. But if you care, then it's there, right? So it's almost like an on-ramping in the world of DeFi, like a fiat on-ramp or an off-ramp where we abstract away a lot of the details. Yeah, I love this. Okay. So maybe one last question here about story where I'm curious for you personally, like what gets you most excited as you think about the trajectory of what you're building? These are obviously some very foundational primitives you're kind of building that could evolve into um, a lot of different activity that maybe isn't even foreseeable right now, right? So I'm curious from kind of that surprise perspective too, like what do you think might become more important over time for how you guys are doing things at Story? And what are you paying attention to? Yeah, this may be high level, but what I'm really excited about is reimagining what creativity can look like and what the types of stories that we're enthralled by as a society and as a culture can look like. Because if you go into the movies and just look at the top 10 charts every year at the box office in the US, <clears throat> all of them are, are sequels or there's some sort of like derivative work. So it's like the 10th Spider-Man, the 10th Avengers, Ant-Man. They're all like IPs that were created decades and decades ago. And there's not much real innovation happening. And the reason why is not because people aren't creative. There's tons of creative people, but because the economics of storytelling really incentivize people just hammering home and milking out the same IPs over and over again, because that's safe. And I think that is, it, it's a reality of the market, but would it be interesting if we could, as a community, really allow people to participate in creating the stories that they're also fans of, like blurring the lines between who's a creator and who's a consumer, who's active and who's passive through blockchain as a technology that coordinates social incentives at scale. So in the same way that people talk about decentralized autonomous organizations or network states, ambitious moving of the political world on chain, like could we also move the cultural world on chain and create extremely new IPs that are almost like decentralized autonomous IPs where someone sets out like a world Bible, but then people add new characters and then they create stories. And it's almost like this Wikipedia for IP where people are being rewarded for what they're creating. And that IP doesn't live on just one app. In the same way that Uniswap is a protocol and you can create your own front end on Uniswap to, that's completely different from the one that the Uniswap Labs has created. What if you could have an IP that lives on chain and anyone could create a front end to it? So there could be some sort of voting tool that helps people vote on characters in that IP or some sort of monetization tool that helps people license specific characters in that IP. And maybe there's a consumer tool that allows people to consume that content. I think that this new way of thinking about moving culture on chain can unlock like the next generation of creative works and they may look completely different from the sort of derivative sequels that we're getting today at the box office. Yeah, I love that vision. Okay, super interesting. Okay, so maybe if we can take a step back, I'd love to spend some time just talking a little bit about the space more broadly. And I I think one question that's also kind of become a bit of a recurring question is 
what do you think we're getting right here in crypto here in 2024? And where do you think we could be doing things a little bit better, just kind of as a space? There's a lot of things I think that are going right. I think that number one, the amount of real talent moving into the space to build on top of existing protocols is really inspiring. So I think, for example, I'll give a huge shout out to Farcaster. We're big fans of what they're doing. I went to Farcon recently, spoke at a panel and just saw all of these extremely talented engineers and entrepreneurs that were building on top of the protocol, right? And that is really the vision. I think that there's been a lot of focus on building infrastructure in crypto and that's needed. There's always, you always need to front load infrastructure development in any new industry and any new technology. And we've been doing that. But now at the time where I'm starting to see really talented people building on top of the primitives that have been laid out in the previous cycles in the previous decade. And I think that's really exciting. So I think that's one thing that we're doing really well as a space. And then, of course, now I think a lot of people are also pushing for regulatory clarity and we're starting to see some victories in Washington. I think that's also really important for the future of the space that we can actually have that clarity and we can operate as an industry with the same transparent rules and regulations that any other industry. I think that's going to be really important too. So those are things I'm positive about, the quality of the talent, the types of things that they're doing, which is leveraging existing primitives rather than endlessly creating infrastructure. That's all great. I think that on the flip side, there is what I've seen a lot of financial nihilism, right? That is less exciting. And there's a lot of, I think the whole meme coin discourse is is something to comment on. I'm not going to go deep into that, but I do think that there is a lot of cynicism about the reality of the space. And people are, as Chris Dixon puts it, like the computer versus the casino. I think within the casino branch of the industry, like there's a lot of people that are cynical there. And that cynicism is self fulfilling. I'm fundamentally a believer that. The world is not deterministic. Technology is not deterministic. Human agency and human beliefs and human willpower has a role to play. So if a lot of the leading voices in the industry are throwing around terms about financial nihilism, then yeah, that's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Like, But we have an ability to shape the industry and our beliefs do matter. And the things that we think about and our notions about what is changeable and what is not do matter. And I'm kind of disappointed with the sort of discourse on financial nihilism. And I think that is the sort of worst of the space and not what it could become. So really just focusing on people building on top of existing infrastructure, as well as more infrastructure for creators. I think there's like a lot of DeFi infrastructure that's already very established, but like infrastructure like story for IP, infrastructure for creative economy, infrastructure for culture and governance and network states. Those are all really optimistic visions that I really subscribe to, but they're countered by this sort of pessimistic undertone that I think has really taken hold and is really like a self-fulfilling negative prophecy. Yeah, super interesting. I really applaud the kind of optimism of what you're pointing to is a better path for the space and for leaders in the space and for those who are even maybe considering kind of joining the space to kind of join the optimistic side, right? Absolutely. So I'm curious too, given your work with Story, I'm always curious, like for founders who may find themselves coming into the space here in 2024, I think that it probably looks different than when you got into the space, right? And so kind of twofold question here. One, how have things changed since you got in the space? And then two, Really like if you could go back and give yourself advice at the beginning of your founder journey, how would you advise that version of yourself from kind of this wiser, more seasoned version? Yeah, in terms of the space, it has evolved a lot. I'll note a few features I think that are most distinct. Number one is that the institutionalization of the space has increased a lot for better and for worse. So I think you're going to get a lot more support. The talent is going to be a lot better better on average, just because so much talent from every other industry in tech has moved into crypto. And these are all very good things. It it does feel like also that the tooling for developers is increased a lot. And basically at this point, maybe a hot take, but at this point, I think better UI is not really an excuse for why we're not onboarding more people. I think better, like you can have a web to UI, right? Like I think NBA Topshop proved this. I think a lot of the social clients have proved this. Even some of the partners we work with at Story are fully web to apps that use Story on the back end. So the UI and the infrastructure needed to make that UI par- achieve parity with Web2 exists. And that certainly wasn't the case when I entered the space. So I think as a builder, the space is much more mature. There's a lot more infrastructure to build a, whatever type of user experience you want, whatever type of end goal that you're driving towards. And you're going to get the support from investors and, and the top talent and top devs that have come over from Web2 into Web3. So I think those are all good things. And if I were to do it all again, the number one piece of advice I would give to someone entering this industry that is unique. I think all of the things that the people at YC say or that other people, I think most startups are pretty similar and people probably in crypto don't treat them as similarly as they should to other startups. Like there's the same fundamental product principles, same fundamental principles of running and operating a great business that apply everywhere. 
So that maybe that's actually one piece of feedback is just there are universal business principles. Sometimes crypto startups don't follow them and, and that doesn't work out very well. But the more important piece of advice I would give to individual founders is the importance of communities and networks in this space. Crypto, for all I said about it growing more mature, it's still a very small industry. And although we are focused on decentralization, when it comes to building these infrastructures and these tools, it is really all about making the right allies in the space and finding the people here that will support you and, and understand your vision. So I would say I didn't realize like how supportive other people could be in the space, but I truly believe that success or failure in the space does hinge in a, to a large degree on who's willing to support that vision, who's willing to offer advice. Um, because it is a very small space, and that means that um, having the right people in your camp can really make or break the success of the product. Love that. Okay. So, Jason, maybe one last question here for you. What is your team working on right now, and what's the best way for people to follow along on the journey? Yeah. So, Story, we've launched our protocol. It's live on Testnet, and you can use it now. We actually have a hackathon that's going on now. I believe the signups close very shortly, but uh, if you're trying to get into that, please just shoot me a message uh, on Twitter. So we have active hackathons. We have documentation, docs.storyprotocol.xyz. You can play around with our protocol now and start building apps on top of it now. And one of the most important priorities for us as a company and our success in the program YP Vision really depends on other builders, other entrepreneurs building massive, sustainable, net new consumer businesses on top of Story. And so if you are interested in that, we have a builders program that you can apply to. It's on our website. And we really offer hands-on support from our engineering team. You can use our office. You can talk to our engineers. We'll introduce you to our investors. We really support people over specific ideas. So if you are top 1% builder in the space, we want to talk to you. And we want to see what we can do to work with you. So the Builders Program is another way to get engaged. And then almost all of our product updates, community updates, anything that would be remotely relevant is on our Twitter and our Discord. So you can please join that. And then I think those are the best ways to get involved, but always my DMs are open. So if you are a builder, please DM me and let's figure out how we can get you started on story. Amazing. Jason, thank you so much for the time. Fascinating stuff you guys are building. And I'm super excited to follow along myself as things progress. So grateful for your time and hope the rest of your week wraps up well. Thanks, Tanner. Appreciate it. All right. Take care. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the episode, go ahead and maybe give us a good five-star rating and subscribe wherever you're getting your podcasts so you can get all the latest conversations with the most interesting crypto founders, investors, and builders from across the world. Thanks so much. Have a good one.